I tend to center my practice on choice. And I think choice is a teacher's best friend when it comes to differentiations. Hello there, and welcome to today's episode of the Easy EdTech Podcast. My name is Monica Burns, and I am so glad that you're here to join me today. If you want to make the most of education, technology, aka EdTech, while well, you are in the right place. My goal has always been to help make EdTech easier and give you ideas you can try yourself, share with a colleague, or bookmark for later in the school year. Every Tuesday here on the Easy Ed Tech podcast, you'll hear stories from my time in the classroom, the work I do now with schools and districts, and my travels to different ed tech events. Get ready for solo episodes where I share some quick tips and stories and interviews full of practical ideas and stories from new guests each month. If we mention something you'd like to check out, make sure to click the link. You'll find it in the episode description or the summary area where you're listening to this podcast, or you can find every episode and all of the resources we mention by going to classtechtips.com slash podcast, or by going to classtechtips.com and just clicking on the Easy Ed Tech podcast button at the top of the page. This episode is sponsored by the second edition of my book, EdTech Essentials. My updated book from ASCD and ISTE is perfect for kicking off the 2024 school year. It features two new essentials on the impact of AI in education, almost 100 chatbot prompts to try, and much more. The second edition of EdTech Essentials is now available on Amazon. Visit my website at classtechtips.com slash books to learn more. This week's episode is titled Gamification in the Literacy Classroom with Lauren Gehr, and we talk about what gamification is and isn't what it looks like in a literacy and STEM classroom, and what to consider if you want to bring these engaging experiences to your students. Let's dive into the conversation. Welcome to the podcast. I am so excited to chat with you about gamification in the literacy classroom and you know beyond. <laughs> but before we jump into all of that, would love for listeners to learn a little bit about your role. You know, what is your role in education? What does your day to day look like? Well, thank you for having me, Monica. I'm Dr. Lauren Ayer, and I've actually had an interesting professional kind of journey this past couple of years. I've taught in an English classroom for the past 14 years, and recently my role has kind of changed in education, and I am going to be an instructional coach at a high school near Columbia, South Carolina. And so I will be supporting teachers across content areas in their classrooms with implementing best practices and things like that to help their students meet um, their learning targets or indicators for our state standards. And But it's kind of the perfect fit for me because I'll still get to research and kind of write about best practices and experiment with crazy ideas I have for good teaching. (laughs) (laughs) Well, having that, you know, perspective, bringing that right into this new role, I'm, you know, really excited to chat about a topic that might, you know, include a word people have heard about before, right? Gamification, but they might not really be sure how to wrap their head around it. I know sometimes we hear, you know, lots of different definitions or lots of different explanations and just really to anchor our conversation about gamification in the literacy classroom and beyond today, you know, what does gamification mean in general, but then more specifically in a classroom or educational setting? Yeah. For me, when I think about gamification, I think about you are transforming some kind of assignment to include elements of 
gaming, whatever that looks like for a student or for the instructor into the way that students master their standards. And it's not always about like playing games and things Mm -hmm. like that, but it's really thinking about, I look at gamification, like looking at the process of creating games. You have those aspects of collaboration and creating stories and focusing on different outcomes. And it's really become this rigorous design for creating authentic products of learning for students that not only encourages the skills, the like what the standards ask for, but also looking at just social emotional things like working with your peers. And I think a lot of people think gamification and it's like either very techy or solitary, but you really have to work with others to make your games make sense. And so you have to think about others, communicate with others. And then of course, we also have these strategies that are just life strategies that are good, like organization and being productive. And so that's kind of what it looks like in my classroom and kind of in my experience with what I've been doing. And I think that's really helpful context for listeners too, because it helps, you know, debunk some of the myths around this, right? That it's, you know, one student playing a game, staring at their screen, right? Just very solitary. Like you said, you know, this is an opportunity for collaboration, for that critical thinking, for organizing, right? For making decisions. And as we connect this back to the literacy, right? Classroom, how can gamification help students dig deeper into texts and improve their comprehension and analytical skills? So I actually started fixating on this idea. My husband is a gamer and plays a lot of games at home. And so I noticed that I really didn't like the shoot 'em up type games, but yeah. what I really loved, <laughs> I loved watching the games with stories where you had a main character that was achieving mm-hmm. something in the game. And I could sit and watch those games forever in our in our younger days. Mm-hmm. So so I fixated on that idea and I was just like, how creative it is of the all of these like artists and designers when they think of all of these different games and storylines and situations. That's a really hard thing to do, I feel like, as an author or a creator. And so that's what kind of got me into this was the fact that it is liter- it's literacy at its best. You have to read, you have to think about outcomes and make mm-hmm. predictions. And so that's kind of what got me into this because I really emphasize with my students creating their own product of learning. And so I don't want them replicating something that I've already told them. I want them to take what I've taught them and do something bigger. And so we can always have students write stories in a very formulate type way, but this enables them to create their own story and kind of give them choice and practice these really difficult skills for English, especially like character development and plot development and Mm -hmm. things like that in a, in an engaging type way. And just that separation, when we think about different gaming experiences, like, you know, the the gaming experience from my world, right, or, or my personal experience is all like Tetris on a Game Boy, which <laughs> did not have very much storytelling right? yeah. or very much depth to it. So if there's someone who's had a similar experience to me, right, they might not understand that there's so much more happening, particularly right in the past decade with well-developed, right? Storytelling within games, right? Unbelievable when you think about all the pathways and all the things that have to happen. I mean, to the point that they're making HBO series, right? Based on games, right? Because the narrative and the storytelling is so Mm -hmm. powerful. So I think that there's this natural connection to ELA skills, right? Whether you're looking at them in an ELA environment, you know, or in a different kind of classroom. So, you know, can you share an example of a successful gamified literacy assignment or or project that you've implemented yourself, or, or maybe you've seen in action with some of the colleagues that you work with? So I actually started this journey with honors English three STEM class. So the high school in which I worked is a nationally ranked STEM school. And so it seemed like a very good 
way to assess those STEM learners with gamification. Mm -hmm. And so for them, they still had to write the stories. We focused on gothic literature, Edgar Allan Poe, things like that, you know, start with the really creepy stuff to pull them in. And Mm -hmm. my students, I originally told them they had to code the game because since it was a STEM English class, there had to be elements of STEM learning in there. And so I asked, you know, I told them they could code it and like type it up however they wanted to do it. And then interestingly, I had some kids that were like, I'm kind of tired of coding. And they were like, can we just do it differently? And I was like, sure. And so they used Google Slides to help them put their links on the slides that would navigate to other slides and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was super cool. And I liked allowing that choice of having them do something that was comfortable for them or their product of learning. But we really focused on setting and how an author uses descriptions and characters Mm -hmm. almost to develop setting and have the plot kind of go along. And so I just had some interesting games that popped up because of course you have STEM students and the sky's the limit because they were just creating the wildest type things. Mm -hmm. But the stories, all of these students that had never been English kids, they were more sciencey, really kind of engaged with the story. I've also done a successful type project as well with college prep students. So CP students that used Google Slides to create choose your own adventure games. That was kind of an old school Mm -hmm. way um, (laughs) of game design. And so the students had already created their own hero based off of a British time period or event in history. And they'd write and they wrote a narrative story about their hero. And so they took their hero and created clickable pathways to lead someone through their story. And then they also had to think of alternate endings. So people had places to go in their game. And so what was really interesting was when I presented this challenge to both STEM students who, you know, are top of the top of everything. And then my CP students, both sets of students really rose to the occasion because you had elements in there of choice and, you know, just the freedom to do what they want and kind of practice their skills in a low stress environment. So it was super fun. And just all those, those options that choice. It's so funny that you mentioned the choose your own adventure stories, because one of my very good friends, she posted a picture like last week of her second grader was reading like a choose your own, like an old school. I don't know where they found it. Choose your own adventure story. I was like, Oh my gosh, I haven't thought about that in a million years, but right. That way of like, you know, navigating it as a consumer, creating something like that. And, you know, you also said something that I don't think I'd ever really considered around, you know, gaming, which is the world building piece and its connection to the setting. You know, we think so much about the character. We think so much about what's going to happen next. And all those things are important, Mm -hmm. right? And great, but we don't always think about the setting, you know, as much. Mm -hmm. And you're so right that when you're developing these kind of experiences or having kids reflect right on experiences that they've had, the setting, right, this world that their character is moving through is so crucial, right, to everything that's happening. So I love that because I do think it could really help someone think deeply, right? Go back to the text, find those connections, or just have some really great conversations about what they're seeing. Well, and I think that especially kind of piggybacking off of what you said, students that play these games don't realize the layers that go into this kind of creation. But then when the students get excited and they start doing it, they don't realize what they're doing is Uh super difficult and rigorous. And so it's always fun for them to kind of struggle through the creation of, especially when we're doing the clickable pathways on Google slide where they're like, Oh my gosh, my link didn't work. Like I have a yeah. hundred slides and that <laughs> one link didn't work. And I was like, seeing them struggle through the creative process of putting these things together. It's there's so much dirty learning going on where it's like, they have to push through the, the struggle. So so many layers. And I love the STEM and the literacy connection, right? From your classroom experience. And of course we know, right. And that's a great example too, of how literacy isn't just part of an ELA classroom. So I'm curious, what have you seen in other subject areas, you know, related to gamification, maybe directly supporting literacy, like your experience or things that you've seen that maybe it's not as right explicit there. would love to hear any other stories or examples you have to share. 
Well, I think this kind of goes along with when I was thinking about what are some of the challenges that teachers face. I think teachers are scared to do assignments like this. Not necessarily scared, though, but they see something like this and they hear gamification and they think playing games. And there are a lot of great resources out there for competitive gaming. So it's like, you know, you answer the questions and like they get points and then they win and all this kind of stuff. But teachers are misunderstanding the engagement of gamification where it takes it to that next level. And you have to do that kinds of that kind of higher order thinking and creating their own game. And so I think teachers get nervous when they hear gaming, they think fun. And then they're like, you can't have fun in a classroom. And I'm like, <laughs> oh gosh, yeah. So, and I haven't really seen very many people, you know, kind of latch on to this idea just in my own little world at my school. Now, obviously our STEM our STEM teachers at our school in their computer programming class, they do a lot of that yeah. kind of stuff. But again, I kind of think that they don't see, it's more of a focus on content and not necessarily the process. Yeah. And so one thing that a lot of our state standards are doing is they're emphasizing more of the skills and less of the content. So for example, in our new history, as I knew, is 2019 revised social study standards. They're more focusing on not when did this war happen, but the skills of comparison and things like that. And how do you compare and contrast all of these different things? And so I think that if people focus more on the actual process and the skills of demonstrating their learning instead of like the right and the wrong and the, oh, the kids get really hyped when we put play Kahoot, which is also a great resource to use with your kids. So, you know, I think more people would be open to using it. And I think, you know, I appreciate your framing there too, right? And the reminder of what this is, what this isn't, what this can look like, and just acknowledging, right, where people may come from, from their past experiences, right? And bring that into a discussion there. There may need to be some shifts there, right? And and having great stories and great examples, like the Mm -hmm. ones you've shared, I think really help people wrap their head around this. So, you know, one thing you mentioned was the choice that you were giving kids Mm -hmm. to explore different things, to create different kinds of products. And I wonder, you know, if you can speak more on how gamification can support differentiated instruction. You know, are you using gamification strategies to assess students or respond to data, kind of a combination of both? What does that look like in your learning environments? So it's interesting because I tend to center my practice on choice. And I think choice is a teacher's best friend when it comes to differentiation. So for example, when I talked about my STEM class, some of the STEM kids were like cracking that coding magic that they do. And they just jumped on it while other students were like, hey, we'd love to just write, you know? And that was so beautiful and kind of hit with where they were comfortable. And I think when you use, when you utilize strategies like gamification, it's the perfect way for students to be comfortable with who they are as learning and learners and for you to challenge them as teachers, but to also challenge them in an achievable way. Like you don't want to have students, if I gave my CP students only the option to code, that would be an arduous task and they would never get to that feeling of someone playing their game and being like, oh my gosh, that was a great game. And so I had some students, I never give them limits or requirements for how long their games have to be. And so I had some students that spent so much time with their games and at the end it was 200 slides. And then some students that like had 10 solid slides and they were like, look what I did. And so, and then of course you kind of build in naturally with your writing workshop process as you look at What does the student need as a writer? You have the students that are very simple sentences and it's Mm -hmm. not as, you know, in depth as others. And so it's, it's a system that you can use in your classroom to naturally differentiate so students can be proud of their learning and can rise to the occasion of challenging themselves. So. No, and just that understanding of what everyone needs responding to those observations, right? Those past experiences and giving them some choice and you just having them create something that they're excited about. And, you know, your emphasis on the process here is 
is so interesting because I feel like, and, and you might be, especially with your ELA background, you know, having conversations on the AI of it all and what this okay. means, right? For kids writing essays and just the mm-hmm. implications. And I feel like many of my conversations this year have been focused on the process, right? What can we do to really celebrate the process as opposed to just celebrate that essay, you know, at the end? Yeah, for sure. And so I love this idea of really leaning into the process and how. Having Mm -hmm. kids create something that they're working with a peer, they're collaborating, they're probably Mm -hmm. getting feedback right in it in a manner, right in a loop uh, too. So just so much to think about here for listeners who are looking to explore something new or maybe revisit something that they haven't right considered in a little bit. So, you know, where can people connect with you? I will link out to all the things so they can find you. They can find that great article on Edutopia uh, that you wrote too. Where can people connect with you? Where can they learn more about your work? Of course, they can visit Edutopia and Edutopia does a great job of, you know, curating their resources from each of their educator writers that they spotlight. But also my blog, Love, focuses on, you know, cultivating the passion of education again and giving teachers access to, you know, resources and strategies to help their students enjoy learning, but also for teachers to enjoy teaching again when teaching can just be so hard right now. And then they can also find me on X at the Gare Bear and for sure, definitely email me. I love sharing resources and collaborating with other other educators. And so any of those ways people can reach out. Well, thank you so much for your time today and sharing all of these great ideas with listeners. Thank you, Monica. This was such a fun conversation and I want to finish up like we always do with a few key points to make this ed tech easy. Gamification promotes critical thinking and collaboration. Students can benefit from choice. Focus on the process as well as the final product. Remember, you can find the show notes and a full list of resources from today's episode, including all of the ways to connect with Lauren by heading to classtechtips.com slash podcast and finding today's episode number 281. You can also check out the summary or description of the podcast. You can find that on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube too. And that will include a link back to the show notes. This episode is sponsored by the second edition of my book, EdTech Essentials. My updated book from ASCD and ISTE is perfect for kicking off the 2024 school year. It features two new essentials on the impact of AI in education, almost 100 chatbot prompts to try, and much more. The second edition of EdTech Essentials is now available on Amazon. Visit my website at classtechtips.com slash books to learn more. Thank you for listening to this new episode of the Easy EdTech Podcast. I love creating new episodes for you each week, but I could use a bit of help spreading the word about the podcast. Can you leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app? Spotify will let you tap on the stars and Apple Podcasts will let you tap on the stars and leave a one or two sentence review. Thank you so much for taking this extra step. It helps other educators find episodes like this one when they're searching for ed tech tips.